so with your uh, bit bucket forks, now's the time to sing for today. And uh, there was something I didn't notice until yesterday, which is which might lead to uh, problems with uh, pulling down the newer version. Is if you go to your Bitbucket repository and your fork um, for the Python, there's this file here that stores all the checkpoints and well. Right now mine is empty, but anytime you save one of the Python notebooks, it puts a checkpoint in there. And yesterday I had not included it in the git ignore file. That is done now. So if you're having trouble pulling, what you'll probably need to do is go in there and delete any of the files in here. And then it should be able to pull just like uh, it usually can. So I'm going to use git bash to go to the uh, I4. That's the problem I had yesterday because when I checked later, it was already there. So I might just uh, start syncing significantly before class. Well, in that case, we'll just work on the uh, master again today. But everything that wasn't there yesterday is there today on the branches. go ahead and open up Jupyter. And today, uh, yesterday we got a little further than I expected to. I was not expecting to finish the whole intro. So today I was thinking we would just do NumPy, but just in case I added the first half or so of uh, plotting with uh, in Python also. So NumPy is uh, one of the packages in Anaconda. It's, it all revolves around something called uh, n-dimensional array. And first thing we need to do is load the package that's done using the import statement. So you import uh, and then the name of the package. And every time you use the function from the package, you have to do np or the name and then dot. If you use as, you could do it as any string you want, and, and uh, that way you only have to type two or maybe three characters. NP is the typical short name for NumPy, so that's why I use it. So we'll do that. And NumPy is pretty big, so it might take a second or two to load. And then this is just one of the Easter eggs in Python. It leads to a little comment about Python. So how are you playing Python? And then everything's so simple. <laughs> and then down here you have the uh, daughter who's 
not into white space. I've Next been a white space is, skeptic. Uh, just sort of a web comic that focuses around topics like physics and some programming and life in general. Like this is one from her most recent one about bugs programming. They're entertaining if you know what it's talking about. So like I said, NumPy uses n-dimensional arrays. Today is going to be a little bit dry for NumPy because we're just using the, the basics of n-dimensional arrays. We're not really, in this notebook, we're not really plotting so you can see what's happening. We're just sort of printing the output. So it's a little bit dry, but these are very useful tools as you'll begin to see compared to something like lists, which is probably the closest analogy I can make between objects. And like I said yesterday, it's really easy to look up documentation. Um, also, NumPy also includes a lot of basic functions like cosine, these then has the pi constant. So, this is what you would expect. And if you want to look up the documentation of that, um, you can see it inputs in an array. Pretty much all of the functions in NumPy, as far as I'm aware, take arrays as input. They can also take lists, but they just internally convert them into arrays. And probably the same thing with tuples. So first things first, let's um, make some arrays. The easiest way to do, well, I'll not say easiest way, the most simple way to do it is you start with a list. So first thing here is defining the list. So you can see I printed out the type there. And then there's also a tuple. And if we want to make an array, we just use a function called np.array. And this is actually working on what x was most recently defined to be, which is a tuple. And now you have an array object. Arrays, they could be any dimension. We're going to start with just one dimension, which you could think of sort of as a vector. Two dimensions you could think of as a matrix, and then it gets more complicated from there. I wouldn't strictly think of it as a matrix because doing math is a little bit different, but it's sort of a good analogy. And here we have a two-dimensional array. You just each of these are rows. You just put a comma between each row. So let's look what that looks like. It's a three by three, and the numbers I just put in correspond. Well. They're just numbers right now. Go down to whatever you want. Arrays could also take, a, you could also have an array with strings in it, but um, that's a little less useful. And also, I defined x up here is um, this array. So if we want to make, a, say we want multiple rows for the same thing, here's a two dimensional array with uh, x as each row, row. So you could sort of think of it as uh, each of these rows is a vector that's x. And then one of the reasons that arrays are very useful is that you can operate on the entire thing at once. Like it'll go through all the elements. Like first thing is uh, operating on x, which is this uh, one dimensional array here, and it gives you all the values right away. You don't need to do any loops, it'll just evaluate each one one by one. And same thing with any dimension. So here's the uh, two dimensional y array. And like I said yesterday, um, we did some indexing with uh, lists when we were doing loops. It's, uh, we're going to get into that with a little more detail on arrays now. 
And this is something that's probably going to be a little bit confusing at least at first, but um, as you get used to it, it just sort of becomes second nature and you have to think about it less and less. So let's just start with this array. It's uh, 15 or 13 values. Uh, the typical notation is start, stop, and step with colons in between inside these brackets. But it, uh, it doesn't have to take all three of those arguments. If you give it one, that'll just be um, whatever value is at that index. If you give it two, that'll be the start and the stop, so anything between those. And step is just like, uh, if your step is two, it'll do every other one. So that one has, well, I guess they all have to be integers. And then negative numbers can also be useful. A negative number for stop indicates that it, the last value is at the end. Um, so a negative one is the last value. So if you're not sure how long your array is and you just want the last value, you could use negative one to look that up without having to look at the length or anything. And then a negative step value will reverse the order of the array. So today, um, this notebook is a little bit longer, and that's mostly just because I included almost every example I could possibly think of. So let's start by finding x to be this array, the one-dimensional array. Then for not the fifth value, it's six, or it's not the fifth value, it's the sixth value, because you start at zero. Mm -hmm. It's a five index. And then negative one is the last value, so that's 13. And then uh, equivalent to just putting the colon in here is the entire array. So that'll give you the whole thing back. And then one thing you should be aware of is if you go, this is not the same as the entire array because it stops at the last value, it doesn't include it. So if you do negative one, it won't um, include 13. If you do want to include the last value, just leave this side blank. This is the easiest way to do it. And then I'll set that back. And then this will um, start with the fifth value because uh, remember it starts at zero. And then it'll go all the way to the end. So here's just an example of that. This will start at the fourth and go to the third from the last. And then eventually you get used to these things. And this is just another example. It's skipping. Well, it's this step. We've now added a step of two. Here is just uh, the step is negative one. Everything else is blank, so it's the same. So this will just reverse the order. As we can see here, it goes from 13 to 1 instead. And then two dimensions and beyond, it gets a little more complicated. So let's have y equal this. It's a 4 by 4. And basically the first, uh, it's the same thing except you put a comma in between each axis, sort of. So the first one is the rows and the next one is the columns. So two comma two, this is row two, column two. So this should be equivalent to the entire thing as you can see here. Well, also this is not what I just said, row two, column two, because once again, it starts at zero. Even it trips me up every once in a while and I've been using Python for a little while now. So see, uh, Row three, column three, the value there is 11. So if we want, just that uh, top left quadrant here, sort of. Remember, it stops at the value. So this is really row zero and row one. So zero, two, two, but not including the index number two, which is really the third. And this one will reverse the uh, rows and because it's uh, 
If you don't include the comma, it just assumes it's the you're referring to the rows. And you don't need um, two colons, but you do need at least one to keep the rows the same and just go to the columns. I think if you don't do any, it will give you an error. You can double check that right now. Yeah, it'll tell you it's not the right syntax. So these are just sort of um, some ways to manipulate with arrays. We'll have a linear algebra topic in a little while, so we'll go more into matrices in a little bit. So that'll probably be, we might start it tomorrow, but more likely it'll be on uh, next Tuesday. Week. Yeah. So this is reversing both of the orders. And this is, uh, so it starts with the second value and it goes to the last value but does not include the last. So this should just, and this is doing it for the rows and the columns. So it should, should just be the uh, middle chunk there. And seeing the examples is great, but you don't really start to learn it until you have to use it and do things with it. So I encourage you to try to do things on your own. And here are just more examples of getting pieces of the array that you want. And also you get a just go for a bunch of specific indexes, like here, if I want, uh, we're back to one-dimensional arrays here, back to x. And say I want the uh, fifth value of the ninth and the thirteenth, I could just stick an array, or a list, or an array, either one works, inside as the indexes. And what that'll do is it'll return the uh, fifth value, the ninth, and the thirteenth, or the uh, yeah, the last one. This is the same as if I put a negative one here. So you can sort of just insert a list of the indexes inside to get specific values you want. Um, so this is more difficult for more than one dimension. What you do is you just um, so here's why again. You put a comma in between. Um, so this would be, they're sort of like coordinates on, on here. So this is the row and this is the column for the first value. So you have two lists, one for each dimension. So this sort of uh, just takes the diagonal indexes 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3 gives you a one-dimensional array of those. But uh, we learned how to make arrays, but doing it by hand is not really convenient. We want quick ways to make arrays. And the uh, first way to do that is the A range function. We saw the range function yesterday when we were making lists for the uh, loops. And this is pretty similar. Uh, except, you know, A for array. And it's the same thing, except uh, it doesn't have to be integers in this step. So, if you look at the documentation if you want, it'll say pretty much the same thing. Um, yeah, it's the same as the other one. If you just do uh, <coughs> info one argument, it'll, that's the stop point. Two is start and stop, and the third, if you do three, it's the step. So it will accept between one and three arguments. So five, it will start at zero and go to four. If you want to start with one. And by default, it does not include the uh, last value. Actually, for this function, I don't think there is an option that you could add the last value. You just have to compensate for it if you do want five in there or something. If you you could do the steps as not integer values, so you could go up. Also if you do something that's uh, well, it's easier to show it. 
see the stop points is not a multiple of the step, so it'll just stop at the value be before it gets over. Another similar command is one space. Uh, this is similar but not the same. It has a start and stop, but the third number is not the step. Instead, it's the number of evenly spaced points that you want in between those two values. <coughs> This one, by default, um, does include the stop, so that's good to know. So it includes the stop. So if I want these to be integers here, I want, or I need six values to go from zero to five. So you sort of need to add one to make it more intuitive. So here's um, by tenths, you just do it split it. 50 times into evenly spaced, and say I wanted to go between 0 and pi 10 times. This is nice because if you're using this for like x values in a function, say I want a sine function and then I'm plotting it, you could have 10 points, and then all you would have to change is this last value to get a more res resolution on sort of your x-axis. You could suddenly have 100 points and it, you'd see the sign much clearer. So they have different uses. Um, you should try to decide which one works suits you better when you're deciding which one to use. And then there's other ways to uh, make arrays, but we won't go into huge details about that. There's um, zeros, and what this takes as input is the shape, and it just fills it with zeros. So, and then you could change the values later. Um, so this one is three dimensions, or yeah, three dimensions. So there's two dimensional arrays and they're just sort of uh, stacked on top of each other. And zero is like, um, it's similar. It takes a, another, well, you, yeah, it inputs, you, it takes another array and gives you um, zero is in the same shape as that. So you could use a pretty much the same way, except if you don't know the dimension or the dimensions changing of the array, you could, uh, so y was our four by four we had earlier. So zero is like, will just give us a four by four filled with zeros. And then the where function is pretty useful. I think in R they have something similar called which, and it returns all indices in an array where your logical statement is true. So it should, um, it returns two values. We almost always only care about the first one, so you could just have a comma. Anytime it, something returns more than two, or a function returns more than two values, you could just uh, separate your variables by commas if you want to. Like, it, this returns a tuple of two values. So if I wanted the second one, I could just do b, and the second one would be stored inside b. And if you had like three, you could just keep going and so on and so forth. Um, it should be noted that the, the developers for NumPy did not have the same attitude as Python developers. So instead of using words like you did in the if statements and other logic inside these functions, you have to use, um, well, this is the same. It's the ands and the ors that are different. So you have to use ampersand instead of and and a vertical bar instead of or. So let's look at some examples here. X is just an array of more or less random numbers that I typed out. Oops, that's right. I added that. Okay, so this is where um, x is equal to 1, and you'll see it's the first value here, and then the fourth value, or fifth value here. So if you get output, 
outputs the indexes. So that's um, these two numbers I printed out. And then if you want those values inside x, say you only want for x is equal to those values, then you just, uh, like I said earlier, you could input an array or a list of indexes into an array, and it'll come out with the values for each of those indexes, which in this case are ones. And here's another one with some more logic. And this is just where it's less than 8 and greater than 1, and then what all those values are. So at first, it seems sort of complicated. It can be confusing when you try to apply the where function. But it can be really useful. Like here's an example. Suppose you have an array A that's the column headers for your data. Then you've got another array D that's um, all the data for the columns in the same order. And say you have a voltage column that's there and you don't know where it, was, where it is. And maybe it's you've got 100 or more columns and you don't want to go in and count out which one is voltage. What you can do is use the NP or the where function to find uh, the index of where that voltage is and then just insert that into the uh, data and see this is just getting the columns because these are the rows and it'll give you all the rows for, for yeah, it'll give you the column for the voltage. And you could do this for maybe if you have a bunch of voltage columns, it'll give you all of those too. And then uh, the above functions make it, all the stuff we just discussed, make it easy to create arrays, but still the question is why use arrays? Like I said, they're, they're just better for doing anything with numbers. Most, so if you want to do some sort of math with them, it's faster to use arrays. For example, um, if it wasn't an array, you would have to use an, a, loop, a loop like this to, if you wanted to perform this sort of operation on it. Like if this was a list, this is what you would have to do. But in NumPy, there's some built-in functions like a range. You can get the same list of numbers with just one function. So first of all, it shortens your code and it's much faster. This is just a little example when you apply to it apply it to other topics, you could get to see the value. And then also you could use some um, array slicing to avoid loops. And it's usually quite a bit faster. So here's an example. It uses the log function. Um, should note that this is a natural log, not log base 10. So physics thing it might throw you off if you're trying to use it in some sort of function. So here, say you want to just use this function for whatever reason. You might think uh, if you're using a list or in other languages, you might have to do a loop to go through every single one of these indexes. Notice I don't start at zero. Um, if log, that's because log of zero makes not good things happen, not because uh, you usually shouldn't start at zero. That's why there's an extra zero at the beginning here, just because I didn't do anything to this value in the loop. And that's for the next several examples. So normally you would have to loop through, uh, I guess, 99 values in this case, whereas with array slicing, you could just define the index beforehand put that into x, and then uh, have that as your inputs to your function too. And this will give you the exact same answer. And at first you might think, well, yeah, maybe it's slightly less code, but it's not the way I'm used to thinking, so what, what's the value of this? And the value of it is that it's much faster. So we'll do this again. But this time we'll do uh, 10 million, and we're going to import the time package, which will just help keep track of how long it 
takes to run. One more question. Can, can, you, can you roll back up? So in Python, uh, the, the first line there, x equals uh, mp zeros. That's just a placeholder. Let's make a empty, yeah, empty yeah. Uh, matrix. So yeah, this in is an R, you know, if you want to one. do a, a make an empty matrix, you can do uh, x equals to null. So then later on, you can uh, fill fill the matrix with anything. In Python, you need to define what's the size of the matrix ahead of time, or you can do something like null in R. Um, as far as I know, yes. I haven't tried it any other way. Yeah. Okay. At least for um, arrays, I've always just defined it first. I've seen something like that before, I don't remember what it was though, but I think it did it specify the lines. So if we do this a million times, um, yeah, I can try. it takes quite a bit longer. For now, we're gonna. These are NumPy functions, so you could actually input um, an entire array at once. Let's pretend that they're not NumPy functions for now. They're other functions that don't take many, many values at once. Maybe they only take one value at once. So that's usually what you end up working with. And then let's. Uh, Go ahead and see how long that takes. This uh, takes about a minute or so, or at least on my laptop. It did. I hope the BDI is in the same range of speed. And array slicing can reduce jobs to take uh, days to minutes sometimes at best. Uh, array slicing isn't always possible. It's not always going to work. Um, you sort of have to judge by at a case by case basis if it is or isn't going to work. But when it does, it's very useful. Um, and for many of us, we learn to program in loops first, unless you started with Python. So they come more naturally, and you might start building your code in loops. And if it has runtime issues, it takes too long, mm -hmm. then you could go back in your code and replace things with array slicing as you go. This is still going. Okay, there we go. Took a little over a minute. Now let's see uh, how long it takes in for array slicing. Just a few seconds. So see already some value here. And the difference is, if you do a loop, it tries to do the values one at a time, whereas in array slicing, it does it all at once. And uh, arrays are used in other packages. 
Um, there's also other parts of NumPy that we will come back to, such as the FFT, which stands for Fast Fourier Transform. There's some overlap in these packages with uh, SciPy. And for the other, for, and uh, mm -hmm. for most of those, we will use SciPy for because it's a more extensive environment. For the FFT, they're pretty much exactly the same. There's only a small difference in runtime for imaginary versus non imaginary, so there's not much difference. And the other topics that are have some overlap are these here. And these are all things uh, we'll go over either tomorrow or on next Tuesday. I, I won't go too much into detail. I'll sort of just give it as if you already know what these topics are and what they're referring to. Because I took an entire course on SciPy and NumPy that lasted a semester. So there's a lot of um, material in it. And I'll just sort of show the basics for those topics and then give you the resources to look up anything more specific you will need. So I think we'll uh, stop there today. If there's uh, any questions. And then tomorrow we'll start with uh, plotting mm -hmm. in Python.